Hello and welcome back to another Nuclear Craft video. It's been quite a long time since I made one of these. Um, there's been a new update to Nuclear Craft finally after all this time. Um, version 2.4 is out. There's lots of new stuff, really interesting stuff. I'm going to get a video out for that straight after this one. This one's going to go through the stuff that was added in 2.3 since I didn't do a video for the 2.3 add-ons. Um, but after this I'll do a video for 2.4. I'll actually do two videos for 2.4 and then we'll be finally up to date again. Um, so yeah, 2.3 came out like two months ago now. Um, there was a couple of things, useful things added. A couple of things that people suggested. Um, first of all, someone suggested that I turn up my mic for these videos. Um, so um, yes, I, I will do that. I'll try to do that anyway. I can't speak too loud because, you know, other people are sort of asleep at the moment. And so I don't want to wake them up. Um, this is the best time to record because, you know, during the day, everyone's sort of doing stuff, there's noise coming from everywhere. My brother's computer is literally a meter behind me, so I can't really do it when he's there. So yeah, basically I have to do it now, and I can't be too loud otherwise people will get mad at me. Um, but anyway, 2.3, so what was added? Well, the main thing that was added, there was two sort of main things that were added. Um, one of them was active cooling, and one of them was comparators um, for f fusion and fission. So first of all, active cooling. Active cooling um, utilizes this block here, the active fluid cooler. Um, you can learn about it there, but um, this is a video that I'm just going to explain it to you. So basically, active cooling can be used to cool down fusion reactors and fission reactors. Um, I'm going to go through fission reactors first. So um, in addition to these reactor ports, which um, allow you to um, access this fission controller, um, you can also put buffers into the side of the... Um, into the side of the fission casing. So buffer block just is a block that you can make. It says what it does, it does what it says on the tin. It's just a buffer, it just stores a bit of energy, stores a bit of fluid, stores a bit of items. And it's basically the way to get um, items, fluid and energy from the uh, outside of the reactor onto the inside. Um, so if we just break in here, um, you can see here that I've got uh, here some resonant ember being pumped into this buffer here. And I've got some water coming from an infinite water source um, coming into this buffer here. So I'm using these two buffers. Um, I am going to add something like, I think someone did actually tell me I should add a trap door or something. Um, I think I'll add a um, casing door and a casing trap door as well, because at the moment, the only way to actually get inside a reactor is by breaking through it. And that can be a little bit annoying, a little bit tedious. So I think I'll add a trap door or something, because that'd be pretty cool. Um, okay, but anyway, back to this. So basically what we want to do is we want to just set up um, the active cooler. Now, the active cooler, the way it actually works is that you basically pump fluid into it and it will use up the fluid to cool down the reactor. Um, you can use water, you can use resonant ender, you can use liquid glowstone. Basically, you can use any of any fluid version of any of the standard coolers. Active cooling rates. So the stuff you can use is water, redstone, glowstone, liquid helium, and deuterium and cryothium, and also ice. So crushed ice from forestry you can also use, although Although it says you can use it, I was testing it earlier, it doesn't seem to. Although the name of the forestry liquid is ice, for some reason it doesn't seem to actually work very well. Um, I need to look into that because um, it should really work. So at the moment ice is a bit of a, a maybe, but all the other ones there work. Um, so the way it basically works is that you just pipe in the fluid into the active cooler. It will use up the fluid to cool down the reactor. They're very, very efficient. But unless you're using water, you can imagine it's very, very expensive. Um, I, even as the mod maker, would recommend that you only ever use water for this. If you have tons and tons of resources or like an ender pearl farm or something, then maybe use something like resident ender. But most of the time, that's really expensive and not really worth um, using. But, you know, use it if you want to. Uh, the reason I'm using resident ender in water is because these are the two that you're most likely to use, probably, because you can set up an ender pearl farm and you can set up an infinite water source really easily. Um, so the actual um, way that the, they work in the reactor and the way that the, the, what you have to do to make them work is you have to put them into positions um, that correspond to their solid coolers. So if you're going to pump in um, molten uh, resonant ender, then you're going to have to make sure that your cooler is in the is in basically in the corner of the reactor. So it must touch at least three reactor casings. So in the case of the enderium, you've got to make sure your active cooler is in one of these corners. Um, if you put it somewhere like here, it just won't work. It won't do any cooling at all. Um, and it won't eat up the fluid, though, if you put it in the wrong place. That's one thing to know. It'll only eat up the fluid and even do anything at all if you put it in the right place. Um, for water, um, the, way, the place you have to put this for water is just on one of the reactor casings. So I'll just put it somewhere like there. 
So then all we need to do is we just need to hook up our um, our fluid ducts. I'm going to just go out here and quickly show you. Uh, let's put a uh, some fuel in this thing. Okay, so once we turn these coolers on, um, we'll sh we should be able to see an effect here. So although there are no cells in here, we should still be able to see the cooling effect of the of the active coolers. So if we just pop back in here. We'll turn these on now. So first of all, let's turn on the water pump. So you can see that it's pulling that out of the buffer and that is going into the active cooler. So if we just close this up now, we should be able to see that 50 heat per tick is being removed. You can change the amount that this cools in the configs. You can do it for every single fluid. Um, but you can see here that 50 heat per tick, that is better than the standard um, water cooler. So the normal water cooler is 20 heat per tick loss. Here it's 50. So this is immediately um, better than the uh, standard coolers. And this is the reason I think water is probably the best thing to use for active cooling, um, especially if you're not using the diamond coolers, which rely on the water coolers. Um, this is the best way of using the active coolers, I think, because water is free and it does a lot better than the standard standard uh, water cooler. So that's minus 50 heat per tick. Um, the active cooler can actually accept, um, I think, up to five infinite water sources worth of, of water. Um, so it will basically, it doesn't have to be fill, uh, fueled, um, filled with water at the maximum rate. Um, whatever water it has every single time it updates um, will be used to cool the reactor. But at the maximum rate, um, it is 50 for water. So let's turn on the, the resonant uh, active cooler now. So let's, oh, no, that's not what I was meant to do. Okay, so now the resonant ender is flowing into the fluid cooler. Let's go outside and see what that does. So you can see here that this is removing a massive amount of heat. So resonant ender and all the other expensive fluids remove huge amounts of heat. Obviously, it's incredibly expensive, but in some cases it might be worth it. If you want to squeeze the absolute max out of your out of your fuel cells, then you're going to need the maximum amount of heat. And this thing heats up a lot, so uh, just cools it down a lot. So in Dirham cooler, normally 140 heat per tick removed. In this case, over 3,000. So a pretty significant increase, but for a massive boost in cost, a continual cost. Um, it's up to you whether you think that's worth it or not. Um, I think in most cases, the water one probably is worth it, but the other ones, it really depends on how many resources you have and exactly what you have set up, like as I say, um, ender farm or something like that. So that's basically active cooling in the um, in the fission reactor. I should probably show you actually, what if, if I actually remove this quickly and I say just put the cooler here. I just want to show you that it actually does matter where they're placed in the reactor. I'll close this up again. You'll see that nothing happens, there's no cooling happening. So it really did matter that the active cooler was up in that corner, um, which corresponds to the um, enderium cooler needing to be in the top corner. So do keep that in mind when you're setting up your reactors. So that is effectively um, active cooling in a nutshell. Um, it's, quite, um, it's quite simple, in some cases quite expensive, but it might be worth it. So it's just an, it's just an extra, extra little feature if you just want to use it. So, so there we are. But the main thing that I added active cooling for was the fusion reactors over here. So normally, um, you remember back in 1.7.10, if you used a comparator setup, um, for your fusion reactor, then you can only get to like 94, 95% efficiency. If you want to squeeze the absolute maximum out of your fusion fuels, you want to use active cooling. So the way active cooling works is that you just put your um, fluid coolers all around the edge of the um, of the electromagnetic ring. They can be on the top corner here, the bottom. Um, you can see I've actually got some on the inside here, powered by infinite water sources. Um, I'm using water here. Again, you can use enderium and redstone, all those different fluids, and they're much more effective. But again, water is probably the best way to go because you can just set up a crap ton of um, infinite water sources. Um, and you can see that what I've got here is you can see once in a while, the temperature of the reactor is just sort of steadying out and being lowered. So every single time it gains a bit, um, the coolers update and they cool the reactor by a little bit. And you can see that I've got it pretty stably around 99%. For a um, boron-11 hydrogen reaction in a size 2 fusion reactor, the maximum power you can get out is 192,000 RF per tick. So we are literally right up the cutting edge of uh, efficiency here. I'm right, right at the limit, 99%. Uh, I'm not going to get it much better than this. Um, and so, yeah, so active coolers are effectively the best way of squeezing out the last bit of um, of energy from your fusion fuels. Obviously it costs a bit more, you have to build all of the active fluid coolers and obviously all of the, the to get all the liquid, all the infinite water sources or whatever, um, but it's probably worth it 
um, because uh, especially in big fusion reactor designs, that last you know, five or six percent can be literally tens of thousands of RF per tick. You don't want to lose out on it if, if you want to be as efficient as possible. Um, talking of comparators, um, so that's pretty much all of, uh, of, of active cooling. You can either do it for fission or for fusion. Um, pretty simple, might be worth doing in some cases. Um, so yeah, talking of comparators, you can see I've got one down here. So the comparator functionality from before has been added if you want a simple way to regulate your fusion reactors. You can see here that I'm hovering at around 93% in this um, tritium-deuterium reaction. So every single time um, the uh, reaction goes over a certain efficiency, the redstone comparator will have a high enough strength for the redstone signal to reach the reactor again. So we might be able to see that. There we go, you can see it triggered and it turned off the reactor for a second and it lowered the efficiency again and so it basically uh, is a simple way to regulate the heat of the reactor um, so basically to stop it going way over the um, the high efficiency threshold to make it if you want if you want it to um, if you want to just make sure that the heat never goes too high then the comparator system is a good way to do that but of course um, first of all your fuel is not going to be used as efficiently and on top of that it's going to turn off once in a while so the actual effective RF per tick also drops. So it's certainly not as um, effective, certainly not as efficient as using the active coolers, but it's definitely a lot simpler. Literally just hook up a comparator and a little redstone ring like this, um, and Bob's your uncle. Um, so there we go, that's the comparators, that's that's pretty easy. Um, another thing that I added, uh, this is, I'm just going, basically going through the changelog again, um, these really nice um, transparent reactor casings that was um, suggested by Stephen Matthews. Thank you very much, Stephen Matthews, for this um, suggestion. So I think that looks quite nice. Um, I'm not really a fan of the um, of the connected textures. I think this this does a good job. I like it sort of looking modular and looking sort of in the same style as the standard reactor casing. So there we go. That's quite nice. You can see what's sort of going on on the inside, which is quite interesting when you've got like pipes and stuff now with the buffers. You've got pipes and stuff going to active coolers and things. It can sometimes be quite interesting looking at the gutty works of of the of the reactor. And over here, um, this was a suggestion by um, Dash OOTV, clear electromagnets. You can see here, I've got some clear electromagnets going on. I can see the fusion plasma inside there. Looks pretty cool. Um, I'm guessing that that suggestion was inspired by the clear electromagnets from the Atomic Science mod. Um, that mod was so cool. And um, a, lot, a lot of this mod is inspired by that mod. And so, yeah. Um, there we go, transparent electromagnets. They basically work in exactly the same way, but they're transparent. Same goes for the, um, the transparent uh, reactor casing as well. So that's that. Um, most of the rest of the 2.3 update was just, um, was just bug fixes. Oh, before I go through the bug fixes, I should mention that there was also a comparator um, add-on for fission reactors like there was before. Now, I just want to give you a warning. Um, it's a little bit slow to update the comparator. Um, at the moment, it sort of updates only every like two seconds. So you don't want to have a reactor that generates too much heat too quickly. Otherwise, it, the comparator might not react quickly enough to turn the reactor off. Um, but this is just a little example of how it works. I've basically just got this lever here that is for, at the moment turning off the fission reactor. Once I flip this lever back up, the redstone torch will power on the fission reactor. And if the heat gets too high, then this comparator redstone signal will head around here and then turn the redstone torch off and turn the reactor off. So if I do this, you'll see that the heat is starting to build up in the in the reactor. You can hear actually the sound effects. I added that in the latest update. There's a few sound effects going on. You might be able to hear that. For some reason, there's a flickering effect. It doesn't actually matter that much, but it does it. I don't even know why. But anyway, you can see the heat starting to build up and build up and build up. And you can see the comparator signal starting to get round. And eventually, it will turn off the reactor and there we go, it stops the reactor from running. I don't actually have any coolers in this design, but it's just a simple demonstration. Obviously, normally you'd um, actually want to, um, you know, you'd actually want to have some coolers so that this sort of setup is actually even worth doing at all. Um, but yeah, at least you know that comparator function functionality for the fission controller is in, but do keep in mind that it doesn't update immediately. It updates every um, 40 ticks by default. You can change that um, in the configs. Um, by changing the fission reactor update rate. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. Don't have reactors that just produce too much heat too quickly or you will create a big hole in the ground. Um, something like this, on the other hand, though, is fine. Um, another option, of course, is to just make the comparator loop smaller. Um, this loop is, I think, like 13 long. If you just want to trigger the, um, 
you know, this redstone torch a lot easier. I could have just made the loop a little bit smaller by just running it underground or something. Um, but you know, you do whatever you want. It's up to up, up to you. Um, so yeah, that's 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 comparators for both fusion and fission. Finally, just a lot of bug fixes. Um, there was a couple of exploits that people could do. So for example, what people were doing, um, it also happened in 1.7.10, but I finally got around to fixing it in this version. Um, so what happened in here, if I just try and find something. Um, so yeah, for example, um, you can see here that the liquid helium reactor, if we just go inside here, I'll just show off. Um, the liquid helium reactor requires um, it, it must touch one active quartz cooler and one reactor casing. Now in the past what happened is that you could just put a quartz cooler down, like here, like just in a random place, and put the, he the liquid helium cooler next to its required, um, you know, adjacencies, and it would work. The liquid helium cooler would work even though the quartz cooler was in a totally invalid place. The quartz cooler needs to be touching at least one active graphite block. Um, so, uh, originally, the liquid helium cooler would still work. Um, now that has changed, so if we just give it this quickly, you'll see if we go outside here, just get a bit of casing, you'll see here that there is no um, cooling happening because the quartz cooler is in an invalid position and so that the um, liquid helium cooler isn't working either. So you can see here that for this to actually work at all, um, the quartz cooler needs to be next to an active graphite block. So the active graphite block uh, let's get some graphite. Where's that? It's probably in here. Graphite. So now that's next to a graphite block, but the graphite block is not active because for it to be active, it needs to be next to at least one reactor cell. So we're going to have to put at least one reactor cell in there. So let's just see what it what it's like um, touching a reactor cell on its own. Let's see how much power a reactor cell, uh, see how much heat a reactor cell generates. 21 heat per tick. So when we put this reactor cell next to this graphite, we should now cool an amount, um, let's have a look, 120 cooling, 200, so roughly 200. So probably in total, maybe like 100, minus 150 because of the effect of the graphite as well. Let's have a look. Yes, there we go, minus 170 heat per tick. So both of those coolers are working because the graphite is active, which means the quartz cooler is active, which means the liquid helium cooler is active. So basically now you can't just sort of cheat by um, using um, coolers in invalid positions to make other coolers work. You have to make sure that all of the coolers that are required for another cooler to work are also themselves in active positions. So that exploit is now impossible to, to do. Um, there was another bug where sometimes the ports couldn't find the controller. That was just my mistake. I just coded it badly, but it now works. You um, energy transfer. There was a few weird bugs where like machines weren't getting energy and stuff. And there was also um, a few bugs where machines were just like stopping running after like the first um, first run, which was a bit weird. Um, but that's now sorted out. Um, automation machines. Yeah, that just talked about that. Fixed a bug where battery blocks did not update correctly. Oh yeah, so now battery blocks, um, they sort of update correctly. Before, when you like sort of shift click them, they weren't like showing what the correct energy storage was. The batteries are still not complete. Um, as you can see here, it says still only accepts energy. So you cannot yet output energy with a um, Voltaic PAL or a lithium ion battery. They only accept power. Um, that will obviously change at some point once I get them like properly working. Um, but let's just turn on this reactor. It isn't going to explode, is it? No. So let's just get it on. Let's just generate a bit of power and you can see that this is updating correctly. So you can see that it's actually updating correctly and telling you how much RF there is stored. So there we go, that's that's, that's nice to see that's working. Um, there were some additional configs, additional tweaks, and updated Forge. And that's pretty much everything that happened in version 2.3. So thank you all for watching. In the next video, I'm gonna start looking at the new version that was just released in the last couple days, version 2.4, um, in particular 2.4b, that's the latest version that's been released um, at the time of this video being recorded. And we're gonna talk about a lot of new stuff. And in particular, you can see here, JEI integration, finally. You guys have been really patient and I thank you so much for that. And finally, we have JEI recipes for all the different machines. You can look through all the cool stuff. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about Mind Tweaker as well, how you can add your own uh, recipes through Craft Tweaker, um, all in the next video. So yeah, I'll see you guys then.